So it's really an honor to have Joe here um, today to share, to share his story. Uh, I personally know Joe. Um, he actually does this uh, semi-professionally. He goes on speaking tours. He speaks to, um, to college campuses. He's spoken at, uh, for events for the Israeli consulate. Um, he speaks beyond our community to the Christian community. And uh, his story is, is one that he will weave um, from growing up as a, a child in Baghdad having to relocate, continually reinventing himself. Um, I really can't do justice to introducing him, but he does a very good job of, um, of uh, telling his own story. So Joe, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Uh, and um, he also has a presentation to share. Along the way, if you guys have any questions, please just drop them in the chat. Um, and if I cannot weave it into his presentation, if Joe doesn't get to it, then I'll be sure to get to it at the end. Uh, thank you, Odin. Uh, thank you, Naya. And thank you, everybody that are here uh, to hear uh, the untold or very rarely told the story of the Jews from Arab land. Uh, I want to introduce myself to you. I was born in Baghdad in the, uh, the Jewish quarter of the old city of Baghdad in December of 1930. This December, the end of December, I'll be celebrating my 90th birthday, God be willing. And um, uh, someone asked me, are you going to retire? I said, no, retirement is only for old people. So uh, I continue to be active. Uh, as you heard before, I used to love traveling. Now I do gardening. And um, I'm going to, uh, during this the my life, I have faced a lot of traumas, and I'll be going into a part PowerPoint that I prepared for this occasion to go over it. And uh, I, Odin, if you could help me to set up this PowerPoint. Absolutely. Um, we are here. So there's the share screen button at the bottom, and if you click that, you'll be able to share your desktop. It should be a green button. Do you oh, see on, that? On, the, on the screen here? On yeah. the Zoom screen, right. Okay. Share. OK. Desktop, I click desktop, Odin. Correct. Wonderful. And then if you remember, there is the that screen at the bottom, that screen icon that helps maximize it. So we clicked yesterday. To the right, to the right, to the right, a little, two more over, one more, that's the one, that's the one. Wonderful. Okay, okay, we are here. Uh, okay, uh, it's the, the, the PowerPoint is very uh, serious and at times somber. So I'd like to start with uh, uh, a bit of humor to inject to my uh, talking with you. Uh, this happened actually to me when I was younger, uh, young at your age, I was very shy. So someone suggested I should take a, a, public, public, a public speaking course. And I did. And I remember at the end of the course, the instructor told us, that to remember whenever you're invited to speak, remember what is a good speech is. Uh, a, a good speech is like a bikini, uh, short enough to be interesting and long enough to cover the subject. So I'll try to stay with that, you know, the time. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Here's my the PowerPoint that I prepared for this occasion. Uh, and we go, uh, the, first, the first slide is uh, the, the only, the recorded history, I'd go back, I mean, I could talk for an hour, but the, the recorded history we begin with when the king of Babylonia, King Nebuchadnezzar, occupied the land of Israel in the year 586 BCE and brought young, and energetic Jews and wiser and learned to Babylonia. Now it's called Baghdad. Uh, just a note to why 
this happened. If you look at the map of the land of Israel, you will see that it is like a bridge connecting Europe, connecting to Africa through Egypt and connecting to the East. So any empire that roses, they want to go, for example, the Roman went to Egypt, they have to pass through the land of Israel. The Greeks, they wanted to go east, they would occupy the land of Israel. The Assyrian, the Babylonian. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a place where many conqueror, many empires and emperor occupied it. With the, with the bringing these uh, refugees to Iraq, to Baghdad, there was many prophets the uh, biblical prophet came with them at the time. And here is uh, the tomb of prophet Ezekiel. Some of you in the Bible read about him. He is in about 50, 50 miles from Baghdad. There was also prophet Ezra and uh, Nehemiah and Jonah was also buried near in the north of Iraq in Mosul. Uh, with these exiles, they came in. So they lived in Babylonia and 70 years later, after the exile arrived to Babylonia, uh, the, uh, was, it was conquered by a new emperor, the empire, the Persian empire that uh, the King Cyrus the Great, 70, year 539 BCE. And King Cyrus allowed the Jews to go back to the land of Israel and build the second temple. And this is the stone where it's written. I saw that in the museum. They brought it in the museum, in, uh, Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, I can't read the writing, but I believe that's what they said it is, and, and that's what, what it, it is. So some of the uh, the Jews left, some stayed. I guess those who stayed are my ancestors where, uh, uh, where, I, where I was born and grew up. Uh, and, and then the Roman uh, occupied the land of Israel again, and they destroyed the temple in the year, in the seven, the year 70 uh, the, of the common era. And this is a painting of showing how the destruction of the second temple. With that, the Jews, the, the Jews uh, spread all over at the time. They went uh, all the way to the Spain and North Africa. They went to also to the, to the, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, to Yemen, uh, to Turkey and Iran. Uh, so they spread all over. And from there, of course, uh, at a certain date, they went to Europe. And that's where they, uh, the Ashkenazi, over the year, they, they, uh, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, they developed this, what they call the Ashkenazi in Europe. During their uh, sojourn in Babylonia, they were uh, at times very prosperous and had the chance to, uh, to, uh, to have a freedom. So they built the, uh, uh, the cities of Sura and Pumbatida, and there were, they have big studies, the Sanhedrin, and where the Babylonian Talmud was written. The Babylonian Talmud is the interpretation, there was two of them. One is the Jerusalem Talmud or the Babylonian Talmud, but most commonly used to interpretation of the Torah is the Babylonian Talmud. And here, just as a picture of one of the pages that was completed in the, in the fifth century, fourth and the fifth century. In the seventh century, a major uh, eruption or development came to that area. The Islam was born in the Saudi Arabia, what's now called Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and there was a lot of Jews living there. Uh, and after the death of Prophet Muhammad, few thousand 
of zealous Muslim on horses, walking camels with swords and, and daggers and a primi very primitive weaponry, they went north to spread Islam. And within one century, they occupied North Africa. They went all the way to Spain, to the east went to Iraq, uh, Syria, Le uh, Iraq, Leb Lebanon. Uh, they went to Iran, Turkey, and they went all the way to the Far East. They went to India, uh, what's now called Afghanistan, uh, Uzbekistan, and they went all the way to China. Uh, a question always risen, how can a few thousand on, on, in, in, on horses and camels have done this occupation in one century? What I learned from the history, the culture, that uh, at the time when they came in, let's say they came into a village or a town, they came in right away with the motto, either you convert to Islam or you die. And even today, converting to Islam, it takes about maybe 20 seconds to 30 seconds. You just repeat what they call the Shahada, that the only God is God and, the, and Muhammad is this passenger and you become a Muslim. So the new converts, the men became the new army that joined the old one on horses and carriage. And they went from one village to another, from one town to another. And that's how the Islam spread within one century uh, to all areas. And of course, in Iraq, uh, in Iraq, uh, also they they spread, and they the Jews they they convert all except they allowed the Jews and Christians to remain uh, without being forced to convert, uh, but they called them vimmies, and they have a, a second hand. A citizenship or status where uh, they paid extra taxes, they, were, they have to wear a special clothing, they were not allowed to ride a horse in the city or build a house higher than the Muslims. Um, Joe, I, I'm sorry, just to interrupt, just in the interest of time, um, to get to your personal story, could you perhaps tell us about a, any of the dimmy status uh, rules that applied while you were uh, growing up in the Jewish community of more contemporary times? Yes. Uh, as Jews in, in the 20th century, when I grew up with, uh, in Baghdad, uh, actually I had a happy childhood there. And I grew up to believe that Baghdad was my home and Iraq was my country. And I'll come to it in the, when I come to the Farhud uh, Odin. So you allow me just to go through quickly here. And then I'll come to the to my life in Baghdad. Uh, we can see here in the 15th century, Turkey became the empire and occupied all this land of uh, North Africa and uh, to Iran, and also all the way to Europe, Romania, Greece, and they were at the outskirts of, of of Austria to near Vienna. In uh, World War One. Uh, came in and the British and the French allied with the Arab. The Arab helped them and they changed the map of the, they dismantled Turkey, only they stayed with their Turkey, Turkish land and they did, they created Iraq. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the Palestine, they called this area Palestine and Transjordan and the French occupied Syria and Lebanon. Uh, to, to reward the Arab that helped them, they brought a uh, princess from, so the, from the Hashemite family and they brought a, a King Faisal, became the king of Iraq and Abdullah the king of Jordan. But King Faisal was very wise and kind man, so he respected the Jewish community. And here's a photo uh, in the 20s where with the Jewish community and the Jewish community in the 1920s really prospered, and it's a renaissance, it had a renaissance time. Uh, King Faisal was so bright, he appointed even his first uh, minister of finance, a Jew, 
Sir uh, Sir uh, Haskell uh, uh, Sasson, and I had a senator, Menachem Daniel, also a Jew. And he was so pro-Jewish that he met with Chaim Weizmann and, uh, uh, and he was very sympathetic for the Jews to, to return to have their homeland. In 1933, he, uh, he died and his son, Gazi, became the king and turned the, the life of the Jews upside down. And he was a pro-Nazi and he died in 1939. Uh, it was told that the car accident, but the rumor has it that the British uh, did away with his life. Uh, then in April of 1941, there was a pro-Nazi coup that uh, deposed the Iraqi government and installed the pro-Nazi in, in, in Baghdad. And, and he showed the picture of the Mufti of Palestine with the, uh, the Prime Minister Rashid Ali Al-Gainani, the head of the coup, and uh, things turned from bad to worse to the Jewish community. So there were the open, uh, the, uh, uh, the newspapers, the radio, anti-Semitism, but the British uh, had still an army in Iraq and they came in in the end of May, in June to Baghdad, and the, the coup leader fled, they went to Germany, and here showed the picture of the Mufti with Hitler in 1941. Uh, in, and in 1941, in, in, in June, the, the, uh, the uh, mobs of Muslim, uh, Muslim men uh, entered to the Jewish quarter, ransacked the Jewish quarter, uh, broke the homes, and looted everything, murdered the, the men and, uh, and the, the children, and raped the women. And the official uh, uh, estimate that 179 Jews, some 500 store were looted and burned, and 1,000 were injured. And this is a picture, a red picture of the Farhud. And the picture shows uh, a, a rare picture of the Farhud in Baghdad, 1941. The Jews are upstairs in their in their balconies, and the Muslim carrying daggers and and and, uh, and sword and knives, in the uh, in the Jewish uh, ready to attack the Jews. And this is a picture of the mass grave of the of the Jews that were murdered in 1941. On a personal level. Uh, we were living in the Jewish quarter, but luckily we moved out of the Jewish quarter one year to a better area, and the looters and the writers did not reach us. But my two uncles' house were looted, and uh, one of them uh, moving from jumping from one roof to another, uh, they broke their leg, and then they came to our house, and we had to buy them a new furniture to live in, uh, to go back to their homes. Uh, things went back to normal, and here's a picture of our family in 1944, and here I am here when I was 14 years old. In 1947, there was the, the, the plan of partition of Palestine to a Jewish state and uh, Arab state, and these are the demonstration where it's, uh, uh, in Arabic it says, the, the new partition plan uh, of Palestine should fail, is not acceptable. And as, as a student at, nine, at, nine, at 17 years old, we went with them uh, that otherwise would be accused that we are, uh, uh, you know, we're Zionist or the, we are, we're not with the Iraqis. And we screamed that down with the partition plan. In my picture, 1948, when I graduated from high school and I applied and I wanted to come to the United States, uh, I got a visa in three universities and I wanted to become a nuclear physicist, but we're not allowed to leave. And after the war of 1948 and Iraq and the Arab failed to destroy Israel and its 
at its birth. Uh, the, the Iraqi government turned against the Jewish population. So summary arrest and accusation and torture and including hanging. And this is a photo of a prominent uh, Jewish merchant, Shafiq Adas, when he was led to the gallows and he was hanged. Uh, when, I, when I heard that he was hanged, I was very terrified and it, uh, it was just a, a sad time for the Jewish population. This is a map that shows the, uh, the Jewish population in Arab land. They were estimated between 850 to a million Jews and showed different places in the population. In Iraq, there was 150, Iran about 100, Morocco 250, Algeria 140. Today, there are maybe about 5,000, mostly in, in, in Morocco and some in uh, uh, Tunis, the Tunis area. Uh, so when turned bad, turned to bad, and I was afraid for my life, I decided to escape. And this is a sketch of the boat. I went from Baghdad to Basra with my younger brother, Nuri. And there's a sketch of how the boat, uh, there's no motors. Uh, there, uh, there was a, a wooden, a wooden uh, structure in that boat covered with hay. And we are hiding inside the boat to go. And we went from Basra to Iraq. And that was a horrific, a horrific story. Uh, how we 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 got, we we got stuck, we couldn't go, and I was worried about the uh, the secret police will get to us and capture us. Uh, I all did all written written all this in my book that uh, that Odin will talk about it. Uh, just because you were on that, and and because I do know the story, Joe, um, I think it's important to point out that that in that boat. There, there were, what were there, like at least nine, 10 children from yeah. different families, from different Jewish families, and each had paid for their child to be on that boat. And, and you were, I believe, the oldest. Yeah, I was appointed as the leader to, to care took care of them for the trip. Right. And uh, when it was stuck, I was really worried how we're going to get some food. And uh, uh, because uh, th th this boat has no motors, so they waited for the tide the downtide to get from the Basra, the southern part of the city of Iraq, to go to Iran. But unfortunately, the tide was with us, but the wind was against us. So we got stuck for the night and the day, and we left the second night. And then from Iran, I went to Israel, and I became, uh, in, uh, this is a photo of the, where the, the Jews, the Arab land became refugees. I, uh, as, as, a, as a refugee, I, I stood up in line in, uh, for, a, uh, for a free meal. Uh, by the way, the, the food that we've given was so strange to me. I never tasted it. We, we got uh, uh, herring, which I never seen in my life. We got uh, uh, margarine, which I never knew. We knew about the butter, black bread, mashed potatoes. Even salami, I didn't know what's all, we didn't eat it. But anyway, was so, I was so hungry. So I ate whatever they gave us in the, in the refugee camp. And you were upper middle class in Baghdad. At yeah, the time, we were correct? Upper, upper class even. So we quite at the end, at, when I was a, a, a teenager, actually our family uh, accumulated more wealth and we had a, a chauffeur and a gardener and maids we lived in a private home called a villa, uh, close to the American embassy in an area called Al Alwiya. But then this was my new life as a homeless, penniless refugee. But I refused to be a refugee and I refused to live in the past. So I look up to my future and from there, I, I, then I joined the Israeli Navy I wanted to go to college, but they were not allowed. We couldn't go to college because they wanted us to be, to be in the army. So this is my picture in the Navy for two and a half years. 
then uh, after the war of 67, the Six Day War, I'm sure most of you know, or of you know about that war where uh, e uh, e e e Egypt and Syria and Jordan were, uh, were preparing to attack, but luckily Israel uh, attacked first and destroyed the air force of all these places and they won the war in 67 and they occupied, now they have a new territory. They occupied Sinai and they went to the Western, the Western Bank also. So in Iraq, they, most of the Jews left in 1951 after a decree, they could leave with their uh, one suitcase but losing their nationality and everything else. So the few thousand Jews left were, uh, were in a very precarious and terrible situation in Baghdad in 1969. I'm sorry, Joe, just to elaborate on that. When you say they could only leave with a briefcase, um, can you explain what that meant leaving behind? Oh, sure. Uh, the Jewish community was very prosperous. They were very influential. And on Shabbat, the whole city was closed. They, they controlled the banking the stores, uh, they were very active in big uh, or corporation and the finance in the, uh, they managed the railway and, and uh, they were all, uh, but when they, when the Iraqi government changed to the Ba'ath group, they started to free, uh, when they, when they allowed them to leave, they have to lose everything, their homes, their businesses, the land, and I remember my mother and my, my brother left with one suitcases. And fortunately in that suit, and, and whatever left there, they were robbed at the airport by the, uh, by the Muslims uh, inspectors. So they couldn't take with them their gold. Uh, some of them buried it in the background of their houses, hoping that one day they will go back, but nothing will happen. They couldn't go back and claim that. So they lost everything uh, in, in, in when they left. Just as the Palestinian uh, lost their homes and land, the about 850,000 Jews from all Arab land, they lost everything. And 600,000 of them went to Israel and they are, now they became the, uh, the nearly half of the population from the Sephardi background. So this picture, when uh, in 1969, the Iraqi government arrested some uh, ten, uh, arrested 10 Jews, accused them of spying. Nine of them were hanged. Unfortunately, this is a, a typical photo of hanging the people. I used to see that when I go to school as a child. And only one person that was innocent, declared innocent, this guy here, is Aaron Zengi, and is my picture with him uh, when he came to Los Angeles. Uh, this is a story about the Iraqi Jewish artifact. I'm going to speak, uh, skip talking about it because it's another uh, more subject about how the, uh, the, the Jews left this, their, their storas and artifacts were stolen. And this is my last slide is why I support Israel. Uh, because it's democratic, an equal vote, the woman right, they have gay rights, minority rights, uh, they even have an Arab in the, in the Supreme Court the, as a judge there. Uh, it's a nation of the future, and they have free religion. And in my life, when I moved from uh, Israel to, to Canada, and I moved to to uh, Los Angeles in 1978 with my, uh, with my five and three kids. And, you know, we, 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 we worked very, uh, none of, uh, I wasn't myself, but went to college, but I have three children. I have two PhD and one MD. And here's a picture in Cabo San Lucas. And I used to be go there every year for the last 19 years with me and my family. And that's, the last slap with my email and my debt. And I give it to you, Odin, see if I 
missed on anything or expand on anything you want to hear and leave it to the, uh, to the uh, audience, the students uh, to uh, have any question or if I want me to expand on anything or extra event, I'll be happy to do that. And thank you all again for joining. Thank you for sharing with us, Joe. Um, everybody, please um, post your questions below. Joe, just because I'm so familiar with your story, um, there are a few, th you, you add some things sometimes. Wait, wait, can you um, unstop share screen? Yes. So we could see everyone, sorry. Uh, there should be, it says you are sharing screen and you should be able to hit stop share, Joe. It's usually at the top of the screen. Top like, the, oh wait, I, I can do it. I, I actually I was able to do it for you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so there are elements you have when you speak sometimes that you don't other times. And I think one thing that, uh, that often people don't understand is just how difficult it is to leave a country that um, that wants that doesn't want to give you permission, um, to put it lightly, and this fact that you were actually admitted to an engineering program in the United States, can you explain why you couldn't actually go to that program and what the year was? Thank you. Good question. I graduated from high school. Well, after the Farhood, uh, I realized that this is not going to be my home. So I was very ambitious to prepare myself to study and went and hoped to come to America to, to, have to go to school. And you don't know how lucky you are that you are able to go to college so easily. Uh, so my dream, I was very scientific minded and I, was, uh, I had the, the key to the, lab, the laboratory of the high school and I used to practice and I dreamt to be a phys nuclear physicist. So I applied to three universities and, I, and got visas to all of them. And then I got a passport, but they were not, we were not allowed to leave. We needed what's called exit visa. I'm sure none of you heard about it. You know, visa to go to another country, but that is exit visa to allow you. So uh, they would not allow me to leave uh, unless I put a, uh, a guarantee, a bond, or a guarantee of 3,000 pounds or dinars, which is, I, to tell you the value of a dinar or a pound, that a family of four lived on four to five dinars a month. So they, could you imagine the 3,000 dinar, what it means? So we couldn't put that money and uh, they wouldn't allow me to leave. So I, then I find myself uh, and obviously that my life is in danger. So that's why I decided to smuggle out and to leave. Hopefully that I can do it in the future. And just to cap that anecdote, and then I'll uh, read you some of the other questions. Um, you had this dream of higher education, Joe, which I know was actually interrupted multiple times, even once you made it from Israel to Canada and you had children and then you had to go into business and you never got to go back to this education you wanted. Um, but Tell us about your three children and what their status is now. Yes, thank you. Uh, I attended three times to go to college, one in Baghdad. Then when I was in Israel, I went to go to, to the university. But unfortunately, in 1950, the security of Israel was so important after the, uh, the uh, Arab invasion, invasion and trying to destroy Israel in 1948. So the first thing was they take the capable body to be in the army. So then after the army, I tried uh, and I, I thought maybe in Canada, I will have more opportunity. So I applied to McGill University in Canada and was accepted. But when I went to Canada, I had new, faced new hurdles. I had no money and a new climate, a new temperature and many other difficulties, and I didn't have any money to go. So I decided to go to work. But since I don't have any special education, any profession, any special talent, so the work that I was, I could do is just a manual. And I know that I will not have any future if I do that. 
So I decided to go to selling, thinking that's the best opportunity for me. And I hope that to make it in selling and uh, that my children will, I give my children in the education. So I decided to go into real estate and I suffered, you know, for six months to eight months, I lived on the drawer of the company at $50 a week. I lived in a cold flats. They didn't have even a heating in the middle of the winter. They had one furnace in the room, but I made it and I concentrated on my, my children and they, I sent them all to college. And I just said before, two of my children are the PhD and my one and daughter, she the dermatologist MD. So my dream of education was fulfilled by my children. Beautiful. Um, so we have a question here. Uh, were you able to reunite with your family um, after what transpired in Iraq? Yes. Uh, I smuggled out like a few thousand people. And after the decree in 1951, the Iraqi government allowed the Jews to leave officially with by, but only what they call the tasqit. You have to, re, to, to, uh, to, to renounce, to reset your nationality. You lose your nationality. Uh, you lose all the properties and everything you have and to be allowed to leave with one suitcase. Uh, so my, my mother and my older brother uh, left in that tasqit. Luckily, they uh, brought a couple of pictures. One of them I showed you of my family. Otherwise, I have no pictures. I don't have my high school certificate. And uh, my father and my mother, I'm sorry, my father and my older brother, they still run the import of textile businesses. And, and one of the, uh, they dealt with a lot of Muslim merchants, which they were honorable and they respected their uh, the agreement with them. But one of them came and they say, you know, I owe you money, but I will ne never ask me when I'm going to pay it. And if you push it, you know what's going to happen to you and your family. So my father and my older brother uh, decided now it's the time to leave. So they were able to, at the time, to smuggle some money, but they left everything, our villa, the car we had, and all the merchandise in there. And they also to smuggled, but this time they smuggled through northern Iraq, through Turkey, through Iran, and they came and they came back to Israel. So that's how the 95% of the Jews of Iraq and many hundreds of thousands of Jews from different parts of the Arab world left. And, uh, uh, you know, you know, Odin, the, the story of Gina from Libya, the, the CAO of the Gimena, Jews indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa in Libya, how she nearly lost her life before she jumped to, to go to Italy. A, a version of your story, some even much more horrendous um, all over the region, unfortunately. Uh, I, got, Joe, if, I have a few questions please. for you. Um, when somebody asks you home, where's home? You've been to over a hundred countries. You, you gave us a pretty um, detailed portrait of Jewish life in exile a strong many hundreds of years of history in Iraq. What's home for you? Good question. Thank you. Uh, wherever I lived, it became my home. In Iraq, I thought it was my home, you know, but I found out not. So I left and I threw the key to my house and my past into the river. When I arrived to Israel, I became an Israeli. I lived as an Israeli, I moved, I, speak, I spoke the language and I served an Israeli. And when I moved to Canada, Canada became my home and I became a, a citizen and I respect it. And as I moved to the United States, United States is my home. Although Israel remains my spiritual home. I love Israel, I support Israel. And although that I still 
have passport, Israeli passport. I do not vote in the election in Israel because I don't feel that I have right to vote because I don't live there. My children don't serve in the army. So I leave whatever the decision in Israel, whoever they elect, and I respect it, love it, and support it, no matter what government is there, right, center, or left. So this is my spiritual home, and these are, uh, and, I, and I love it. Uh, I hope that I answered your question. Um, we have a couple questions from teens as well. When you moved to Canada, did you speak English? And perhaps you can speak to this idea of um, reinventing yourself and the kind of mentality that's necessary. To sure. Do that thing. In Baghdad, uh, I learned to read Hebrew. We we're not allowed to learn to speak Hebrew. So I grew up with a religious family and my father used to take me to the synagogue and Shabbat and to pray. And of course, I have very fond memories of the Shabbat, uh, Shabbat dinner and the Shabbat day. And with the, we used to get with the family together and all the Sukkot. And um, uh, so I, I uh, uh, remember that very clearly. And uh, uh, from there, uh, you know, I, I, what was the question again, uh, Odin? Uh, it had to do with um, how. No, did you, how did, did, you know did you know English when you moved? Oh, to yes, yes, I'm sorry. How many languages? So we learned, you yeah. So I learned Hebrew and in the school we learned English. And, and then after high school, I learned French. So when I was about 18, 19, I spoke four languages. I spoke, the, my mother tongue was Arabic and I learned Hebrew, but this time is the underground. We learned Hebrew to speak and French and English was part a, a secondary language that I spoke well and the French. So when I moved to Israel, I spoke Hebrew fluently. And when I moved to Canada, of course, I spoke English, but not as, the, as a native, but I learned. And then because I lived in Montreal and the majority in Montreal was French. So I learned French. And when I was doing real estate and I moved from there to do construction. So I had the contract and I spoke to French people who were working in the construction. So I'm fond, I, I have, thank God, I have special talent to languages. I love to learn languages. Now I speak Spanish. I learned in Israel Italian. Uh, and I, I've learned to speak, whenever I traveled, one of the most enjoyable part of traveling is I learned the language before I go to the country. I bought tapes and I listened to the language and all when I need about 100, 150 words that I can communicate. And to the first thing I learned when I go to a new country, how to say, how much? This is too much. That's the first thing I learned when I travel in, in the language of a country. So, uh, uh, so ju just because we're running short on time, we're going to do a, like a little speed round if you can give quick answers just so we can get through all the questions certainly. that the teens have asked. Um, were you ever discriminated against um, in Israel for being uh, a Mizrahi? I personally never experienced the discrimination, but I heard from close friends and family, especially those who came adults and they were, they were trying to work, uh, you know, to find jobs and to work that they were discriminated against. And uh, I, I understand Israel was established by mostly Ashkenazi group, is in, in the uh, Israelis. So if they have their their own immigrant from Romania or Poland, they gave them the job. They were discriminated. But personally, I could say that I did not feel that discrimination. Right. Um, is there any talk or expectation or? Um an effort to get reparations from Iraq or these Arab governments for all the billions that were taken? Yes, I think the, the Israeli government did not take action or they take effective measures to make our story, the Jews from Arab as refugees, as the Palestinians 
uh, they, uh, they, uh, they claim as refugees. Because we are all, and this is the secret of Jews and, and the reasons, and some of the reasons of anti-Semitism, because the history of the Jewish people, whenever they fall, they do not remain as victim and they fall, but rather like me, you know, I never stayed living in my past and uh, claiming that I was a victim, although that I, that I was, but I refused to live in my victimhood. So, uh, so they, 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 they we rise, rise up, rise above that, and look at me. I have two, and my brother and my sister. Between us, you know, we had eight children. Four of them are MD, two are PhD, one is a teacher, and one the and one of them won the world uh, the world prize in puzzle solving for Canada. This is how we instill Amazing. education in our children and refuse to be victim victimized. And then the world loved the victims, but the Jews they rise up and they prospered, and that perhaps one of the reasons of anti-Semitism. Wow. Um, can you uh, just explain succinctly what the Farhud was? Just no, no, no. I mean the word, the word Farhud. What is it the actually? Farhud oh. is an Arabic word translation to violent disposition, uh, where the there's no this law, lawlessness and uh, people do whatever they want. Uh, I don't know, I, well, you're Is it like young. pogrom for Russian? Pogrom, you know pogrom? that's right. Pogrom in Russian, that's when they, they looted, they murdered, they killed. I must emphasize, Naya, that there were some Muslim men that stood up in front of the Jewish home, their friends, and protected these homes, protected their Jews, and even took them to their own homes. So not all Muslims are bad or what they did, but only like these are the righteous Gentile, what we, you know, we have them in Israel. And these are the, the good people that, that stood up and protected some Jews. But, uh, you know, the Farhud took two days and it was a miserable situation where they killed and they murdered. In fact, my older brother, who's seven years older, he took his bicycle on the day of the Farhud to go to visit his friend. And he came running back because he saw how the, the writers stopping the mini buses, we never had big buses, but small buses that took 10, 15 people and dragged the Jewish, it was Shavuot time, the feast of Shavuot, dragged these Jews dressed up in a nice clothes, slot, uh, slaughter them, rob them, murder, rape the women. So he ran back crying to what he saw. And, and he told us the story. And- uh, But and Joe, I have a question. In 1941, Israel was not yet created. Why the violence against the Jews? Why? You're, it's very true. There was no Zionism then. We we only say the Shanaha Ba'ab Yerushalayim in the when we read the Haggadah, but we didn't know what Jerusalem, what Israel. It just was part of the telling the story. But uh, the Jews were considered a second at, at best. They were considered as as uh, foreigners. At worst, were considered as traitors to some Muslims. And they, uh, they just went because, again, part of anti-Semitism, because they were rich. They were also some poor Jews, but because of their wealth and they see them as, you know, their, their oppressor, their, why they are rich and they are poor. So it's motivated by the pro-Nazi coup that they did and raise up all these, uh, took a chance and a privilege to go, a privilege, but to, to, to loot, write, and kill. In my book, uh, I think I have uh, the, I don't know if you could see it here. Uh, can you see I, it? Unfortunately not. I can, I can link everyone to it afterwards too. Um, yeah, 
in my book, in my memoir, I, uh, maybe this way you could see it. Anyway, uh, he will, uh, Odin will show it. I describe the Farhud in details. I describe my journey and my struggle and how I refused to stay a victim in the past and a typical of the Jews, whether it's European after the Holocaust or the 850,000 or a million Jews that lived once in North Africa. There are no one that living in a, in a, in a refugee camp, a Jew. In compare, and I wrote an article once comparing myself to an Arab Palestinian refugee, how for 70 years they sit in a miserable tent waiting for the, for the food to be given to them, for waiting for the UNRWA to support them. It's a miserable way to live in the past and to live as a refugees. And as a Jew, I would never refuse to do that, like all other Jews from Arab land. Wow. Um, I want to hear from you guys. I'm sorry, this is so exciting to have you. Um, I have a question for you. Um, when I re read about this story of the Farhud and the expulsion of Jews from Arab lands, <clears throat> I read that the way that they talked in the newspapers, they would say, these nine Zionists are, are suspected of espionage. And they would talk about, an, they would talk about it as anti-Zionism. What do you think about that? In terms of, you know, when people say today, oh, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism or, or how do you understand this topic? I know it's a huge I, question, but. Anti-Zionism is a, a subterfuge to anti-Jewish, anti anti-Semitism. It's a clear, because we as Jews, Zionism is part of our life. Zionism is our hope, you know, to have a homeland. And if you look at the map, Israel is so small versus maybe 1% of the land of the Arab around it. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a cover up. And instead of saying anti-Semitism, they go to anti-Zionism. But do you think that that's what they did in Iraq when they called them Zionists instead of Jews? Like, why did they say Zionists? They could have said Jews. Because it's, a, again, they want to give them, a, they have a reason. They call them anti, they are Zionists and spies. And as, I as you saw in the slide, they allowed one person and uh, that uh, Aaron Zangi to be allowed. When I heard the story of the torture of what they went there, you know, they couldn't survive. In fact, they were one person that while torturing he was killed, but then they had a, a they, they condemned the other nine to hanging in 1969. And look at the mentality of when they hanged them in public square, Naya, they had a day of celebration. The government office was closed, schools was closed. There was some 500,000 people celebrating the hanging of the Jews. It was like a picnic day with the, with the kebabs, with the shashlik, with all kinds of things, celebrating that. And they have to cover it. They can't say Jews to cover up. The, so they, these are Zionists and spies. That's how they cover up all the time. So, but we were Iraqis. We felt Iraqis. We behaved. We, the Jews of Iraq were so important to Iraq because they contributed. They were the engineers, they were the accountants, the financier, the merchant, the importer. They, and that I hear now so many are missing, miss the Jews from Iraq. I hear many of the uh, Iraqis. And in fact, I'm translating my book to Arabic. And I had an Iraqi person in Iraq helping me to translate it into Arabic. And, you know, and he remembers, he says his father told him about the Jewish neighbors and how nice they were there together. So I hope my, my book will be read with so many Arab that they can see to get out from that victimhood mentality. I met a, an Iraqi at the airport, Joe, just at, the, at my gate. Um, they were waiting for another flight. And they didn't know anything about the history of Jews in Iraq. 
They're non-Jews, Iraqi non-Jews? That was an Iraqi non-Jew. So, you know, that part, it's, they're losing their own history. They well, don't they're burying, are they, they're probably burying that history. Absolutely, absolutely. But 2,500 years and erased in half a century. 2,500 years of Iraq's history erased for their own population. In, in, in 20 Iraq. years, never mind half a century. It was all, it was all gone. But the same thing is with the Arab, uh, Arab country where they lost their Jewish populations, you know? So it is, it's, you could see what happened to Iraq without the Jews, you know, that they say, uh, you know, those who love the Jews, they are, they are blessed and those who, uh, you know, they don't, they are, they are cursed. And uh, you can see what happened to Iraq. I'm not saying that because I'm revengeful. I don't have hate in my heart and I'm not revengeful because I pity the, the Iraqis. I, I sympathize with what they're suffering, but at the other minorities, Naya, the Christian, the Yazidis, uh, the Alawite, the, all of them, they have suffered and they, they right. are suffering now. That's right. Um, do you guys have any questions before I bombard with more questions? Shaya, go ahead, unmute yourself. Is there a name for um, the expulsion of Jews from other places, like not Iraq? If there is a name of not expulsion? Of the expulsion of Jews from like other Arab countries, not like not Iraq. Yeah, well, each country had their own history but the result was the, or the same, Shaya. Uh, for example, the Egyptian, the, the Jews from Egypt were, uh, you know, they, they, had, they had comfortable life. They were, again, just like the Iraqi Jews, they were rich. But then we see how the new leader comes and they start, you know, persecution. They had laws of fro freezing the bank, bank account like what they did in Iraq. They lost their jobs. I have a friend of mine who left in the 70s. Her husband was a pharmacist, pharmacist and they came in one day, the pharmacy, the six pharmacy in Baghdad were locked and they couldn't go back to it. So that's what happened in Egypt uh, in, in Libya, they were burning some, some homes the only country that did not have such a open anti-Semitism was in Morocco. But they, 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 the Jews there realized that they, they days, the days are numbers to live there. So they left mostly to France, to Montreal, Canada, and some, most of them left to, to Israel. So I don't know if there's a specific name, but they all left uh, for for their life more than anything else to try to save their lives, and to, I, I look back, I look back and I say, thank God that I lost everything. Uh, imagine me staying in that black hole, and facing Saddam Hussein, and after that the ISIS and all the what what will happen? I'm I'm happy that I lost with the shirt that I left with the shirt on my back, and I don't look back because I have a new life and I'm, I have now more than I ever dreamt in my life to have. I'm comfortable, I have lovely children, I'm secured, my kids are doing well, and, and so are my sister, my family, all of them. They are, we, are, we are a better, far better than we stay. That's amazing. Thank Just you. I, we don't, I don't think there's a word to describe this mass expulsion, like we have, for instance, this holocaust, the, the word Holocaust or Shoah, we don't really have a word. And so much because of the work of the activism of Jemena, they really pushed for a month of commemoration. And this month, November, is the month of Mizrahi commemoration, where we remember that the lives of these people who were lost, the lives, the expulsion. Um, and, and, and so this is something that we also at Club Z celebrate, commemorate. Exactly, exactly. And it's official now, the Israeli government declaring that November 30th, 30th is a commemoration of the Mizrahi Jews. So that's what we do, you know. I'm always invited to share my, my story 
I wish I could share the story about happiness and how to succeed in life instead of telling my story of the past. But my success is only part of my life. You did end up succeeding, though. I mean, it depends what you measure success by, but kind of, you did. Sure. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy my children are doing well and everybody. And I'm happy to share my story. I still feel I'm, I'm young as you are to talk to you and be with you. I'm so thankful that you got to come and share your story because I didn't even know about this. So thank you. Um, and actually, Shia, I think it's really important to recognize how little people know about this and the disconnect that people have with the with the Jewish story, because this is a big part of the Jewish story, and don't and don't and don't understand Israel's position and the trauma in the history of so many Jewish Israeli families. Israel is always looked at through this World War II, Holocaust, European Zionist lens. But the story of half the Jewish families in Israel actually is quite different. Um, and so it's, of course, there's going to be a disconnect uh, between the rest of the world and the Israel story, because even the Jews of America don't understand the story of a lot of Jews of Israel. So th this is actually a very big rabbit hole that I would encourage all of you um, to dive into. What can we do to like help spread this story like more on a higher scale so that more people can understand and know this history? Yeah. Um, so wait, 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 wait. Oh, that was sorry. an amazing question. That I love that question. Joe, what can look they're all like from the ages of, I think, 14 to 18. They have social media. They can bring you as a guest speaker. They're so like, what What do you think they can do? And then Odin will also weigh in. Well, I, I thank you for your dedication. And what you're doing is fundamental. So if you can, you know, have the courage to share your story, to, to uh, tell there is a story, and as what you're saying, I, you know, with the, with the social media and get your friend to know about it. Uh, you know, you can, Odin will, will talk about the book that I wrote is, is quite important uh, to know the details that, uh, you know, a, a, a life story, how to start from the bottom, actually from, I was quite in the wealth, then I became a homeless, penniless refugee, then I became my own, you know, uh, independent with concentrating on kids and my family. And I think by you as youth, younger generation, you are the really the, the, the future builders or the builders of the future uh, to, to, to spread that word and to stand up for Israel. We need each one of you as, as a pillar to do that. Absolutely. Odin, you want to? Media. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, one, one thing is even putting it on people's radars. Right now, so many people don't even have an inkling about this. So sharing that Forgotten Refugees documentary is a start. Um, uh, are you guys all familiar with the Shoah Foundation and, it, and all the interviews? This seems we put together this foundation to interview all these Holocaust survivors. So there are efforts to do the same to document the history, um, the, the firsthand accounts of what these hundreds of thousands of Jews faced. Um, and uh, that's also another resource that um, I, can, I can send out a couple links. Uh, I wish I had a better singular answer for you, but that in itself is the problem, is that there hasn't been enough work done in the space. And just like the way we're losing a lot of our Holocaust survivors, um, the, the infrastructure for educating about this isn't there. Now, if you grow up in Israel, you're gonna to go to school, you're gonna grow up going to school and you're gonna have a buddy who has a, you know, Iraqi mom and a Polish dad. Like you're, you know, you're gonna to go to these restaurants or cafes that are just fusion, you know, you're gonna have a, a bareka that's Sephardic infused with like Eastern European ingredients, whatever it is. You're gonna inherently absorb parts of the story. Us in the diaspora, we just, 
haven't been exposed to the refugees as much. Now, living in LA um, or New York, you have more of an opportunity to, but you have to understand that these refugee communities are relatively new. They've only been in the States or Canada or England for one or two generations. And what happens is they bring over their mentality of, of how they existed as a Jewish community in the Middle East, North Africa. And the way you survived is you kept your head down and you give your money and you get your news and you speak politically only within your congregation. So the Sephardic Mizrahi communities across the country, they actually don't interact with the Federation. They don't interact politically. So there's also been kind of um, this isolationism that's actually a survival mechanism, which is how Jews have survived all the different pogroms and kingdoms and uh, wars uh, for thousands of years in a region. So there has to be outreach both from the Ashkenazi communities and the Sephardic communities need to get better at also saying, we are here, here's our perspective, here's our experience, here's where it's similar, but here's where it's different. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And the more time that passes um, from the time of origin, right? We don't have these communities anymore. What we have is kind of like the ripples of those communities, all the isms, the humor and the food and the wisdoms that come that developed over time in each of these regions. Um, it, it really right now is kind of an individual mission that a lot of, that more and more people are getting on board with. Um, but I- Now I'm here's kind of where I differ, here uh, Joe, yeah. is where I differ with Odin. I don't want to preserve these stories as much because I see, I see this, uh, I see this as it's a sad situation that happened to almost a million Jews in Arab land, but it's a happy ending. It's a happy ending of going home. Home is not Iraq. Home is not Morocco. Home is Israel. Being, being complete is having ownership over your own narrative. And forgetting your narrative and not understanding what it took to get to where you are, you will not be complete, even if you're in Israel. Okay? Um, that, that's my personal opinion. Well, uh, not being able, to, on, honestly. Oh, Dean and I, by the way, are like, we have a whole thing between us where I am like, fine, you want to remember, but he's like, it's a rich 2000 year history with food and culture and songs. And we have to keep this memory alive. And I'm like, why? How can you we skip, got to Israel. Can you skip from the fall of the temple to present day? Like Joe, that's I'm not from a former story. Soviet Union. just pick up from 2000 years ago. <laughs> We've had more time out of Israel than we have had in Israel. That Joe, is our I'm story. From, I'm from the former Soviet Union. I was born in Ukraine. I have no interest in preserving my Russian Jewish history. Zero. Well, allow me to interject here. Yes, please. <laughs> Churchill said, the country that doesn't remember its history, it has no future. So we need to learn something about our history, but remember, we don't have to live in it. You know, just remember it as a story. So although it's, you know, we cannot just completely ignore it, but we, I think we need to know something about it. I would, you know, we don't say it with a, with a, oh, we suffered when we are poor people, but we need to remember the good times and the bad times. And, you know, I attend a Zoom every Shabbat and there are some Russians who lived, they just came in here, grown ups, and they described the life in Russia. So it's this inspiring, it is enlightening other to know what, what some people think about communism and what happened. But you don't need to, you know, to dwell on it and, and cry. That's what happened to poor me. But we need to know something about our history. That's my answer. And also, like even, you know, like not only in the Middle East, also in Europe, like there were thousands of years of like, like lots of Jewish history in Europe and tons of, you know, development, like especially with like, you know, Talmud and Chalacha, like there's like so much like rich history that, you know, like is important that you know was you know developed outside of Israel like you know basically you know all of like the Judaism that we follow today was established outside of Israel at least for like practices so I think like and especially like 
you know, the, like the main Talmud that we follow is like the Talmud Babli that was like developed in Baghdad, Babylon. So like, I think there's like definitely very important and we can't just, you know, gloss over all this stuff now that we're back in Israel. Oh, nobody's glossing over. Yeah, Shia, go. Naya, you were the one who just taught us on Monday, or yeah, Monday, memory is one of the legs of Judaism, and now you're trying to cut off your own leg. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get paid in this class, or is, is only Naya allowed to? We have to allow <laughs> this is this is a very big conversation and and it's a very like important way into how do we frame what's happened who we are now um and you know it, it's a good one to keep going back and forth on that we're not going to figure right, it but out it's a story of we were home then we were there as a way station we were there in poland we were there in russia we were in north africa we were here we developed some interesting things here but it's all a story of, uh, the, the story has an ending and the ending goes back to Israel. It's the story of the Jewish people, man. It's, it's you need it all, you need it all. You can't pull anything out. Well, I would say it's like the most important part is the journey or ever. Um, sorry, I, yes, this, yes. But you see, Odin and I, we have this robust um, mm, debate. Yeah. Uh, Naya, I hear you clearly. I understand what you're saying, uh, you, you know, but remembering the history is important. We don't have to live in that history, you know, as part of our history. Of course, our, 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 the present and our life here, wherever we are, we build that is our home. I know your questions. This is our home. This is our culture. This is the, what we are. Number one, I came to America because I chose to be here and I made it my home. And my loyalty is uh, as, a, as, a, as a national as an, in America. But the history is just part of our lives. And we, still, we, need, we need somehow to remember the history. I know sometimes it's painful, but we remember the good times also. You know, so I, I, I believe that it's important to to talk about it, uh, you know, to, to just to, to, to see it's part of our, the, the past is only past of the part of the present and the future. That's how I look at it. Let's see, Joe, I don't share a language with you. I don't share a cuisine with you. I don't share a, um, rituals in many ways, but I feel so close to you. You are my family. If uh, you are my family. Sorry, I'm going to like get really emotional, but you are because you're Jewish, but I don't speak Arabic. I wasn't there for 2000 years, but I want to light candles with you. I want you're my family. But isn't the power of that precisely because we are a family that was split apart? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's exactly right. But that it doesn't take anything away from saying I was on this journey. And it was really fucked up at times. Oh my it God. Also okay. make, oh, I'm sorry, guys. Easy. Um, it, it was really messed up at times. But also because I was on that journey, do you know what I realized about being Jewish? Do you know what I understood about the Torah, about halacha, because I was in Babylon? And you cannot, you can't parse that out. You, that, oh, you, you have to honor it all. And you have to honor your ancestors and your family that are in that graveyard in Iraq and in Turkey. Yes, because they had their full Jewish lives, whether or not they were in Israel, while they lived in those countries Agreed. for centuries. Yes, I tell you one cute story in my travel, Naya. Whenever I am on Shabbat, I go visit a synagogue wherever I am. Where I am in uh, Buenos Aires, whether I'm in London, whether I'm in Moscow, whether I am uh, anywhere I go in Egypt. Be, when I go there, I am part of, I feel I am part with my brothers there, although that I don't speak y uh, Yiddish fluently. I learned Yiddish in Israel, but I don't speak Yiddish fluently, and I don't have the same cultures, you know, the, the, the same language that they speak. But I'm part of one family. That's right. And that's what connects us. Amen, amen. <laughs>
we're running over on time. Yeah, we are running over our time. I'm so sorry. I've burnt. Look at your time now, not overnight. <laughs> after night. Any, any other? Can they email you with questions? Can I they that. reach out to you? It would be my pleasure. You have my email, uh, Odin. Uh, uh, of course. You, you can you, with the link. You can show them the cover of my book with the details on it. I'll drop your blog in there as well. He keeps a blog, guys. I mean, this guy. You're Do you remember how? Oh, wait, I, I was in the car when I was driving. Did you say you're ninety years old? Next month. Wow! Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Um, and are you coming? I hear that you're also going to be coming to uh, um, also virtually to Charlotte to talk to tell your story to the Charlotte teens. No, I've I've not been. I, no, no, that's Olga's class. Olga is out of Charlotte on Saturday. Yeah, he will, right? I yes. will. I will be speaking to them on Zoom. That's right. You know? uh, Naya, up to about thirteen years ago, I never talked to anybody about my life. I buried the pain and I never discussed it. Then in 2007, I joined class of memoir. So I started writing. And the first time I wrote about my escape from Iraq. And when I read the first time, I cried from the first to the end all the time, you know? And I felt these tears were bittersweet, that of expressing the, in the fear that I buried in with me and the fear of, and the joy of freedom. So uh, telling that since then I began to tell it and I tell it as a story. You know, I, I don't live it anymore, but I tell as a story. And I think the important to tell the history is very important, you know, to have to tell the history and to share it with people because without history, we have no future. I think let's give Joe that final word. Um, Naya, I don't know if you have any announcements or not, but no. I love you all, Joe. I love you, Naya. I love you. <laughs> right. No, I'm kidding. We're really uh, lucky hey, to have you, Joe. Yeah, we're very lucky that we got you, Joe, because um, I've heard so much about you in the LA community. I've heard your name come up so often. So I'm very, very happy. Thank you so much for coming to us today. Oof, very, very happy. Spasiba. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for logging in. See you next week. I'll send you some uh, stuff by Joe, his blog. Um, and that, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. God bless. Uh, Love thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.